Dr. Lane Norton is a titan in the field of nutrition. He's a juggernaut, he's a behemoth of information who holds a PhD in nutritional sciences, but he has also held the IPF squat world record with 303 kilos in the 93 kilo weight class. He's won six powerlifting titles, seven bodybuilding competitions, so he's extraordinarily well-rounded in the field of getting jacked, building strength, shredding fat, and debating nutrition, which he does a lot on his Twitter page, but has also done on the Joe Rogan podcast. And it's also appeared on our podcast as well, if you want to check that one out. So he's a very big virtuoso in the field of fitness, one of the most influential guys in the space. Hello. And today you're gonna to learn exactly what his supplements are, exactly what his macronutrients are, how his protein needs increase and decrease based on his goals, his approach to cycling carbohydrates, and more. For an in-person consultation answering these sorts of questions, he would charge a lot more than the zero dollars you're paying as a YouTube viewer, so I gotta say you're in for a treat today. Now my first question was about macronutrients, how he structures his intake and what they are. I was interested to learn that Lane does not abide by the practice of tracking what percentage of your overall calories come from the three macronutrients. It's very, very common, but that's not for him. So why not? Um, so let's say you're, you're somebody at maintenance, but then you start dieting because you're going to try and like get into a weight class, or you're dieting for a show or whatever it is. If you keep that same percentage, your protein intake actually goes down. But protein needs don't go down when you diet, they go up. So to me, percentages never really make sense. So with his clients, first he works out their total calorie needs based on their goals, like fat loss, muscle gain, maintenance, whatever. Then he works out their protein intake. But unlike a lot of people, he doesn't base protein intake on your body weight. Instead, he bases it off of your lean body mass, your LBM, which is just your body weight minus all the body fat you've got. And that falls anywhere between, uh, if I'm in a gaining phase, that can be anywhere from you know, 2 to 2.4 grams per kilogram of lean body weight. If I'm in a fat loss phase, I may go as high as like anywhere from 2.4 to 3 grams per kilogram of lean body mass. So Lane adheres to this notion that's supported by a few studies out there. Not a lot of studies because bodybuilder macros don't get a ton of funding relative to some perhaps more pressing issues. But there are some studies like this one published in the Journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition that followed bodybuilders and found that for folks looking to have like bodybuilder levels of body fat and muscularity, that if you're in a weight loss phase, like leading up to competition, you're trying to lose as much fat as you can, Increasing protein up to three grams per kilogram of lean body mass could be an effective strategy. Um, so I'll set protein, I'll deduct that from my calories, and then whatever's left over is divvied up to carbs or fat uh, by preference, basically. Because if you look at the research out there, it's even with overfeeding or uh, dieting, there doesn't seem to be much difference um, in terms of lean body mass accrual or fat mass accrual with how you split up your carbs and fats as long as protein and calories are equated. Now this is an unusually lenient approach with carbs and fat. A lot of people, like a lot of coaches, will have really strict minimums for each, but the one thing I think most people can agree on when it comes to nutrition is that different things work for different people. Some people feel a lot better on lower carbs, some people feel a lot better on lower fat, and it does take experimentation to find out where you fall on that spectrum. Lane, personally, after his protein, he likes the rest of his calories to be about 55% from carbohydrates and 45% from fat. But that's just his personal preference. And the preference that you'll have is likely going to take some experimentation. Now, you might have had that and thought, well, hang on, I do have to get a minimum amount of fat, otherwise you're gonna be low in testosterone, right? I mean, some research has linked a low-fat diet to lower levels of testosterone, but so is a calorie deficit, like pretty strongly linked to low testosterone. A lot of bodybuilders will tell you that, like sex drive takes a big hit the leaner you get as you're losing weight leading up to a competition. So does Lane have a minimum amount of fat he recommends you reach? Uh, honestly, I'm not sure what that cap would be. 0.3 grams per kilogram probably sounds about right. Cause I mean, you'd be looking at somebody who's, you know, if you're hundred kilos, you don't want to go under 30 grams of fat. That seems about right to me. But he's very careful to note that this is just conjecture. The most important things are calories and protein, then divvying up the carbs and fat based on what feels right for you. That said, if you're getting really, really lean and really low on calories leading up to a bodybuilding show, you're likely not going to feel that great regardless of your macronutrient split just because the body doesn't love being at sub 5% body fat. While we're talking macros, I was surprised to learn that lean doesn't feel that carbohydrate cycling, like eating more carbs and more calories on days you work out, is superior to eating the same amount of calories consistently throughout the week. Uh, I know that when I do major lifts, the power lifts like squat, uh, deadlift, especially not so much bench press, but squat and deadlift, I burn way more calories during those workouts, probably about 50 to 70% more. Usually on those days, um, I will eat more food. 
So I'll, I'll bump up my calories a little bit. As far as like research showing that to be superior, it doesn't exist. There's plenty of people who eat the same thing every day and get really good results. And the fact of the matter is, you know, let's say you were eating at maintenance, for example, and one day you had a really hard workout to the other day you're off, but you eat the same on each day. Well, on the day you're off, you might be eating over your maintenance, but that means you also have a surplus that rolls into the day where you're eating under your maintenance while you're training. And the fact is that this stuff kind of rolls together. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like the clock strikes midnight and all of a sudden everything resets and it doesn't matter what you had the day before. That's, that's not how it works. So I think that boils down to more so personal preference. I personally like having more food on days I'm training harder. That's my personal preference. Um, but there's just no evidence to suggest it's superior, but um, I prefer it. But what I find is interestingly, people tend to try to validate their personal preferences by trying to do mental gymnastics as to why their preference is better. And I always tell people, I'm like, why is it just not okay to say, I just prefer that. So I just prefer that. All right, let's talk supplements. Lane is actually launching his own supplement company later this year called Outwork Nutrition. So this is a subject that's very near and dear to his heart. And they actually divides up his supplements into three tiers. The priorities down to the nice to haves if you got them. This is his first tier. Whey protein, uh, just for a convenient protein source. I don't think you need to chug a super hydrolyzed, crazy anabolic whey post-workout or anything. Um, I think whey protein though is a great uh, protein source um, because it one it's a high quality protein a lot of leucine content in there two it generally tastes very good uh, and three it's pretty inexpensive so i think whey protein is a great supplement if you have no gi problems and you don't care about lactose a whey protein concentrate is just fine if you do have gastrointestinal issues from dairy or if you're just really really trying to limit carbohydrates or fat then whey isolate might be a better pick it's a bit more expensive but it is a bit higher in protein um, if you have you know, really bad GI problems, you can't tolerate any lactose, or even you have issues with the lactalbumins in whey, uh, then a whey hydrolysate would probably be your best bet. The plus side is almost anybody can, can tolerate that because it's pre-digested. The downside is it tastes worse and it costs more. Uh, as far as other supplements, creatine monohydrate, it's king. There is no supplement that has been tested more with better results consistently in the scientific literature for increasing lean body mass, increasing strength. It's cheap and effective. And that's why supplement companies are always trying to come out with new forms of creatine so they can charge you more because creatine monohydrate is king, but creatine monohydrate saturate has been shown to saturate the muscle cell 100% phosphocreatine stores. You don't need anything else. Don't waste your money on anything else. Lane notes that creatine hydrochloride, while it's possible you might need less of it to saturate your muscles, still isn't really an economical option as a result. It's so much more expensive that it's still not the cheaper option when comparing it with monohydrate. If you happen to get gastrointestinal issues when you're loading creatine monohydrate, a better option is probably just to not load creatine monohydrate because you don't really have to. And I just tell people, you know, don't load it. If you take a five gram dose per day, it'll saturate your creatine stores within a month. But if even five grams of creatine monohydrate gives you gastrointestinal distress, yeah, it might be worth looking into hydrochloride. Uh, that said, this is not medical advice at all. Speak to a physician if you're having any thoughts about taking any new supplements or anything like that. There's one more supplement in Lane's first tier. Uh, caffeine. Not, not sexy, but it is one of the most uh, effective supplements out there in terms of if you want something that will immediately improve performance, focus, um, those sorts of things, caffeine is your best bet. It, 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 it works. Uh, obviously you can build up a tolerance and there are some people who are very sensitive to it. I tell people probably every few months, it's not a bad idea to do a caffeine reset where you go cold turkey for about a week. Uh, if you go cold turkey for a week, you can completely reset your caffeine tolerance. Uh, I've done it. It works great. It feels like crap during that week where you're not having it, but you get over it. Uh, you sleep great though. <laughs> So that would be kind of like my first tier of supplements. And then moving down to the second tier would be things like citrulline malate, perhaps beta alanine. If you're somebody who likes to do high repetition work or you like to do high intensity cardio, beta alanine has some good data on it. There's some data that suggests it may uh, increase lean body mass. That's because beta alanine usually dose from like 1.6 to 3.2 grams. 
has some pretty interesting links to increased endurance. It's one of the most common pre-workout ingredients because like the research is pretty solid there. Citrulline, meanwhile, is probably the next most common pre-workout ingredient, and that's because a dose of about five grams or maybe more has links to improving blood flow. In fact, it's actually quite common in erectile dysfunction supplements as a result. When used as an ergogenic aid, like in a pre-workout type context, yeah, it has links to increasing anaerobic output, aerobic output, power output, and helping with time to fatigue as well. Um, there's also things like nootropics. I really like uh, things like rhodiola rosea. That's an adaptogen that has some really good data around it on uh, fatigue resistance and perception of fatigue. And then as you kind of move down the tiers, you know, you've got things like um, if you're worried about recovery, you know, things like tart cherry extract, which can reduce delayed onset muscle soreness. There's some really good evidence for that in resistance trained individuals. A promising supplement that I, we are putting in our product that I, I still want to see more research on is ashwagandha. There seems to be some really promising literature on that. I would consider those in like the third tier, but only because the research right now is kind of all positive but it's just not very much. So I want to see more, but those are kind of be some of the, that's kind of what I'm taking right now. It's just what's in the products that we've been testing. You might be surprised to learn that there are no BCAAs on that list. And that's because Lane's opinion on them has changed in recent years, as it has for a lot of people across the industry. I think the BCAAs probably still have some applicability in certain situations, specific situations, but I think for the vast majority of people, they're probably not worth it. And what I'm talking about is for people who, if you're getting really sore after training, it's impeding uh, recovery between bouts, they may have some applicability. I mean, there, there is good research indicating that they reduce delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, they might have, um, for people that get low quality protein, like vegans, adding BCAAs to a meal may help enhance that protein quality. Uh, but for your average person who's eating enough high quality protein, who isn't getting crazy sore after their workouts and having trouble with recovery, probably not worth it. There is something that I've changed my mind on over the years, and that's even with my bias of my research being in BCAAs, you know? So, hey, that's that's science. You know, we get more information and we, we change our minds. All right, that's the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Lane Norton. Uh, his nutrition coaching app called Carbon is available on iOS and Android. Sorry, shameless uh, shilling here. It gives you a food tracker and nutrition recommendations based on your goals and preferences. And you also get help from real life coaches as well. So check that out if you like what you've heard so far. I've also put a link to the full article of this interview in the description below, where there's some stuff that I didn't have time to put into the video today, like how his actual meals changed throughout his competition prep. So if you want to learn more about Lane Norton's opinions on nutrition, check that out as well. And then finally, Make sure you subscribe to the Barbin YouTube channel as well because we've got a lot more athlete interviews, nutrition tips, breaking news, exercise guides, and a lot more coming up.